Thank you, Manish, for your introduction. Yeah, um, this talk is on an advanced theory of ductile fracture. And this theory is, is brand new in the class of models that deals with uh, ductile fracture modeling in magnesium alloys. So a little bit of motivation, you know, magnesium alloys have been gaining attraction over the uh, last few years, especially because of their high strength and uh, low weight properties. And they are promising candidates for replacing conventional alloys in automotive and aerospace sectors. However, they have very little ductility because of their highly anisotropic properties. And since they are highly anisotropic, it is difficult to model their ductility. Ductile fracture occurs with a process of void nucleation, growth, and coalescence. In terms of more recent research, we call void growth process as homogeneous yielding. What does that mean is plastic flow is diffuse in the matrix of, of voids and uh, material. Void coalescence is accelerated void growth. We call this as inhomogeneous yielding. It is because there is a preferred direction along which the plastic flow localizes in the uh, intervoid ligament. As I will show you later, there is a parallel one can draw between inhomogeneous yielding with certain number of systems and the crystal plasticity with a certain number of flip systems or deformation systems. There has been a lot of work done in the past 50 years on magnesium plasticity. And there has been a lot of work done in ductile fracture in the past 50 years. But however, a yeah, comprehensive theory that accounts for ductile fracture in magnesium alloys is still lacking. A little bit of background on magnesium plasticity. Of course, there is a lot of work that one can hear mentioned in a minute. Uh, starting with uh, Kalidin crystal plasticity model and the famous VPAC models by Levinson and Atnu, and the more recent crystal plasticity model by Zhang and Joshi, who improved Kalidin model for better hardening and well calibrated for magnesium alloys. And there have been interesting developments of phenomenological models by Kasaku and re reduced order models by Becker and Kondari. What these kinds of models offer is that we can use these kinds of models to do fine micromechanical studies where the matrix is governed by any of this. For example, if the matrix is governed by Zhang and Joshi crystal plasticity model, one can get a fine micromechanical study of how voids grow in a magnesium uh, matrix. These kinds of studies are different to classical unit cell simulations with J2 matrix or Hill matrix because they are highly directional dependent. What does that mean is depending on the loading direction, you will see totally different kind of response. For instance, if you load in prismatic direction, like for instance, in the, I'll, I'll avoid the details. If you load in the prismat, prismatic uh, direction, you will get uh, glide deformation mode. If you load in C-axis direction, you will get twinning deformation mode followed by gliding. And you also see the classical effect of triaxiality. So increase in triaxiality, you will have reduction in the strain to failure and etc. A second example for magnesium plasticity is, is by Kondari et al. He used a reduced order model to represent a glide and twinning deformation mode in magnesium plasticity. Although these kinds of models lose fidelity in comparison to crystal plasticity model, they are more practical in, in doing structural simulations because it is too much expensive to combine magnesium plasticity and voids. So even with the reduced order models, you get all the essential deformation mechanisms of glide, twin, and the tension compression, asymmetry, and anisotropy, et cetera. What is ductile fracture is, for instance, if you take a round bar and if you start pulling the round bar, you will have void nucleated at this stage and the voids grow and they coalesce with the neighbor to form micro crack and they grow, gradually evolve to form micro crack and at the end you will have failure. So in this whole process, void growth and void coalescence are the important physical mechanisms to be modeled in order to capture the uh, complete ductile fracture. Void Growth is also called as homogeneous yielding, as I said earlier, where plastic flow is diffuse in the matrix. For instance, if you are familiar with Gerson type models, all types of Gerson type models are called as homogeneous yielding models. The thing that you may not be familiar with is this new concept called inhomogeneous yielding, where plastic flow localizes in the lig uh, intravoid ligament. If inhomogeneous yielding is occurring, means there can be a variety of systems. Variety of systems meaning just like in crystal plasticity where slip system or twin system is set by the crystallographic order. Here, the distribution of voids in the matrix sets the IO systems. These kinds of model had its origin since 2002 and a recent model by Karlaringa and Chokalingam in 2016. 
the aim here is to combine two distinct formulations. One is the crystal plasticity or the reduced order models of Baba Kondari and the ductile fracture a theory of continuum materials such as Kersan model plus void coalescence models. So combining these two theories, we develop a new theory called high NY square, where the two occurrence for two deformation modes such as glide and fly. In the multi-surface theory, the total rate of deformation is additively decomposed as elastic and plastic part, where the elastic part is given by poor elasticity, where M is the elastic complex tensor, that's a function of isotropic stiffness tensor and the void attributes through SLB tensor. And the plastic rate of deformation is written as contribution from individual yielding mechanisms. For instance, in homogeneous yielding, you will have glide homogeneous yielding and twin homogeneous yielding, and you will have glide in homogeneous yielding and twin in homogeneous yielding. And you will have n number of IV systems, meaning that there can be two n in homogeneous yieldings in uh, glide and twin. And gamma dots are the plastic multiplier and fees are the yield criterions for the corresponding deformation modes. For homogeneous yielding in glide and twinning, a typical yield gradient can be written as follows, where I can take either G or T, uh, symbolizing glide and twin, where this yield criterion has a quadratic term and an exponential term. And this yield criterion is a function of porosity and W, a matrix that characterizes shape and orientation of the void. And the sigma bar I takes either glide or twin, twin strength, and there are other factors which I will come uh, come to you. And uh, the quadratic functions are basically the, uh, the function that governs whether the deformation is, is in the glide mode or in the twin mode. The quadratic functions are functions of reduced order tensor S, which is a transformed stress, uh, stress tensor that accounts for the magnesium anisotrope. And the linear form H accounts for the interaction between void and the magnesium plasticity here. And if it's a simple Gerson model, the quadratic function reduced to equivalent stress and this linear form H reduced to hydrostatic stress. There's one extra term that you could notice here that, that you may, may not have seen in other models, which is the Steiler factor. The Steiler factor is introduced uh, here in order to account for uh, anisotropy induced texture evolution. For instance, in case of magnesium alloys, the presence of void can, can introduce um, twinning reorientation, et cetera. So the presence of this Taylor factor will essentially capture the, all the uh, quantitative uh, aspect of uh, ductile fracture modeling. And the other factors such as G, kappa, and et cetera, are functions of internal state variables and uh, such as porosity and void shape and orientation. A typical Yield criterion for inhomogeneous yielding is a function of porosity, void shape and orientation, and two new extra terms that was not present in the homogeneous yielding mode. That is the direction of coalescence given by the vector n and the void spacing ratio, lambda. What is void spacing ratio is inhomogeneous yieldings needs the details of how close the void is um, uh, to coalesce. So lambda essentially is defined as the distance between voids perpendicular to the plane and this is between the voids in, in the plane. So the ratio of this will govern, will govern in, in finding an estimate for when the, the, when the material is entering into the coalescence mode. For instance, in magnesium plasticity, you can have the slip plane that to be totally different from the plane of coalescence. For instance, red, K, red plane can be your slip plane, but uh, coalescence can happen in the gray, gray plane. So this will, the criterion will simply reduce to the resolved normal stress and resolved shear stress on the gray plane rather than the resolved normal stress or resolved shear stress on the red plane. However, the contemporary yield criteria that we have developed are for materials with cylindrical voids. So the ellipsoidal voids will be converted to an equal and cylindrical void by conserving the volume. And W bar and FP are the, are the void aspect ratio and porosity of the uh, cylindrical void in the ligament. In this work, Carlorma and Chapilicum criterion is used. And this takes the structure similar to the homogeneous yielding model with a quadratic term and an exponential term. For instance, in case of uh, coalescence in tension, the effect of shear goes away. And the, the main parameter that governs the coalescence in tension is simply beta, which is a function of the circuit variables, the porosity in the ligament and void aspect ratio. And the Taylor factors again are introduced here that accounts for the 
void induced anisotropy evolutions in the magnesium plasticity. Next, I will briefly uh, discuss about the evolution equation, equations in the material. First one is the porosity evolution. The contribution due to all yielding mechanisms such as the twin glide will enter through this uh, tensor dB. So you don't, you, know, you don't need to write the individual evolution equations for each mechanisms. And whereas the evolution of void shape and um, orientation is pretty involved, where you will have contributions from every mechanisms as I wrote the expressions for dB, where just a reminder that W is the matrix that characterizes the shape and orientation of void. If you do eigen analysis of W, the eigenvalues are nothing but the semi-axis lengths of the void, and eigenvectors are nothing but the semi-axis orientation of the voids. The expressions for W dot glide at twin or W dot glide at twin in inhomogeneous yielding takes this form where the dVs and omega Vs are the strain rate and rotation rate of the void. The expressions for strain rate and rotation rate of the void for homogeneous yieldings are taken from Audu et al's work. And the strain rate and rotation rate of the voids for inhomogeneous yielding or yieldings are developed as a part of this research. The basic difference between these two is that for homogeneous yielding, the plastic flow is assumed to be diffuse in the matrix, whereas for inhomogeneous yielding, the plastic flow is assumed to be localized in the ligament, where the void will try to bulge out and coalesce with the neighbor in case of coalescence in tension, and the void will try to rotate and extend to coalesce with the neighbor in case of coalescence in shear. And the third set of equations is the convections of convection of inhomogeneous yielding plane, where n is the normal to the I-way plane, it rotates in a direction that is opposite to how a material plane evolves based on the kinematics laws of continuum mechanics. And S is the direction of shear, and T is the third vector that is opposite to the normal vector and the shear vector. And the void spacing ratio, I mean, how close the voids are in the current deformation mode is defined by, based on the deformation gradient. Again, this is based on the kinematics of deformation uh, in continuum mechanics. If the material is hardening, and especially in, in magnesium plasticity, there can be two different types of hardening. One is the hardening due to glide, and, and second is the hardening due to twin. So the plast equivalence of plastic work due to two different modes are additively summed in order to get the average plastic strain evolution due to glide and twin. And the corresponding strengths of glide and twin are obtained based on this OCA type saturation law that accounts for self-hardening as well as latent hardening uh, due to the glide and twin. The next set of slides will talk about the results. This reduced order model of Baba Kandori is implemented in Abacus UMAT. And we carried out unit cell simulations with void where, with void where matrix is governed by the reduced order model instead of the actual crystal plasticity model by Selvaraju. So the reduced order model saves the computational cost such that the one 3D calculations using reduced order model, model costs around 10 power two SUs. A, a corresponding 3D calculation using a crystal plasticity model will cost around 10 power three SUs. Whereas our new theory that we implemented that accounts for void and, and the magnesium plasticity will take about 10 power zero SUs. I mean, basically our new theory runs everything in a minute. And whereas, you know, uh, there's, direct numerical simulations will, will take about at least 10 power two SUs. Next couple of slides will show comparisons of unit cell simulations against the high NY theory. What you see here is the dashed lines are from the FEM unit cell simulations and the solid lines are from the high NY theory. The comparisons over here are the porosity and the equivalent stress and the semi-axis lengths of the void and and the semi-axis lengths of the void. These are under the cases of axisymmetric loading and in the plasmatic loading directions. What you can see here is the first point is the high NY theory captures load drop all the way down to zero. Unlike what you see in FEM where you cannot really get a load drop down to zero. And the second thing that you can see it is in almost all the cases you, you, you see a good qualitative agreement in comparison to unit cell simulations and you see in all modes, the, the model enters into glide deformation mode as we expected in the uh, unit cell simulations. Whereas if we load the same model in C-axis loading, it enters into twinning deformation mode followed by the glide deformation mode. The new model that we 
developed also captures the similar qualitative features with, with not so optimized choice of Taylor factors. So these results are brand new and never captured ever, ever before in the field of ductile fracture. So with that, I'll close my talk saying, a theory of ductile fracture is constructed by adopting two independent developments of multi-surface plasticity. One is the reduced order model of Baba Cantori and our white growth and white coalescence mechanisms. The theory captures all the primary deformation mechanisms in magnesium plasticity, such as glide, twin, tension, compression, asymmetry, and etc. This provides a good prospect for addressing key challenges in the area of tactile fracture. That, thank you. I'll take any questions that you may have.